Someone asked me how I would escape the belay if I was belaying from a Connecticut tree hitch anchor. Let's take the opportunity to talk about the principles of escaping the belay and apply them to some unconventional belaying scenarios to illustrate how knowing the why behind a procedure can be beneficial beyond simply knowing the how. Hello again all, I'm Jason. When moving through moderate terrain, we might go through a section with a fall hazard and decide to deploy the rope to protect that section. You can watch an entire series we did on assessment and tactics for technical scrambling, that is using the rope to quickly add protection to sections of moderate climbing with lower fall forces where fully pitched out procedures aren't necessary. But that type of rope work is often fundamentally different than typical pitched climbing. One example of that is using the Connecticut tree hitch. To tie the hitch, we wrap a bite of rope around the tree or rock, push the bites from the strands going to both climbers through that original bite, and then clip a carabiner around the original bite with the gate screwing down or using a double or triple action carabiner. Note that if we clip the wrong rope sections, in this case the bites coming from the climbers, we can get an anchor that looks like it is functioning, but which will fall apart. But even if built correctly, what we have is the weight of the two climbers tensioning the bite that is pinching the climber's ends against the carabiner. Sometimes a climber using the hitch will simply use a body belay or belay off the harness, given the less severe fall forces of the terrain we are traveling. I got asked the question, given the anchor's reliance on tension and lack of a master point, how would a belayer escape the belay should their following climber take a fall, get injured, and need assistance. Let's complicate this by assuming we need to hold the fallen climber in place despite the moderate terrain. For example, if they've come to rest on a ledge with a larger fall potential. Well, the principles of the belay escape are still the same, and we can apply them to this situation, and indeed other less conventional belay setups. If we were on a normal anchor belaying from the top, we've got three macro steps to escape the belay. First, we need to go hands-free while keeping our climbing partner and ourselves secure. Second, we need to take our climbing partner's load and move it from our device by applying it to a robust and secure anchor. Third, we remove ourselves from the system so that we can attend to our partner, go get help, or the like. If we apply those macro steps to our Connecticut tree hitch setup, they don't change. We just need to be thoughtful with how we apply them. Let's say we are belaying off of our harness. Given that one of the main points of using kinetic tree hitch is to be able to get into and out of the system very quickly, minus any accident, it isn't unusual to use a munter. But the process is essentially the same if we were using a device. First, we need to go hands-free so we can tie off the munter with a mule knot and overhand. We have a short with a link in the description on tying off a munter or a device that goes through each of these step by step. Second, we need to transfer our climber's weight to the anchor, but we don't have a master point, so we need to make one. We can tie an overhand in the strand that makes up the brake strand slack. Now we can go through our load transfer procedure, which is similar to other standard methods. We create a friction hitch, like a clem heist, around the load strand beyond our tied off belay. And we have another short that goes into how to tie that knot. We bring the free ends back to the master point and create a muntor on a locking carabiner then add a mule knot. If we have short tails, we need to add an overhand to tie it off like we did with our belay munter. If we have really long tails, we can just pull them through. Now we tension the friction hitch to take the load. At this point, we carefully undo our original mule and overhand on the belay, making sure to not lose control of the brake strand. We can then introduce slack into the rope while making sure the friction hitch is holding. We don't want our climber reliant on that friction hitch though, so we take our slack rope add another munter to a locker back at the master point, and complete another mule overhand knot, keeping that system as tensioned as possible. Now we can remove the friction hitch and take the material with us, which we might need as we go help our climber. We are now onto the third macro step, removing ourselves from the system. In this case, I don't feel like leaving a free tail that is held by tension in the Connecticut tree hitch is adequate, so I will create a tether, clip in, come out of my rope knot, and add a bite knot to my tie-in end that is clipped to the master point to close the system. From here, 
we've completed the three major steps of escaping the belay and can work on assisting our climber in whatever form that will take. But now, let's make an even more reductive anchor. What if we are just using a terrain belay, like wrapping the rope around a tree? In this case, as we hold the belay, we can create a Riebschneuer hitch. Using the rope behind my belay, I can add a locker to a clove hitch and then clip that locker to the load strand. A pull on the load strand will now only tighten the system around the tree. Tying this while holding the tension can be tricky, but in this case, our climber shouldn't be free hanging. If they are, we probably should have been pitching out the climb and using a more traditional anchor with a pre-rigged master point. Rather quickly then, the fallen climber is now held by the anchor and is on the rope, not a friction hitch, and I, the belayer, am hands-free. But I'm not free to move yet. Note that if I move down, I will pull the Reepschner's blocking carabiner loose. So not only do I need to come out of the system, I also need to make an anchor that is capable of holding my load. Here I can make any other anchor, a sling with a master point, a bowline with the excess rope, or the like. This would be my connection point where I could fix my rope slack and rappel down if needed. And we could reduce our system even further. Let's say we are planning on a class three scramble and so took a rope and harness in case we were surprised by some terrain difficulty. But the easier climbing makes us select, say, a body belay, so we are the anchor. Sort of like in the previous case, we may need to solve for steps one and two, going hands-free and transferring the load to an anchor at basically the same time. If we've selected a good body belay position, we may have some terrain feature we are using as our brace. Our goal is to move the rope onto that terrain brace. This won't be easy, but it may be possible with the system not fully weighted and by adding friction into the system with each new section of rope that is pressed into the terrain. Eventually, we can spin out of the system. Now we are back to a terrain belay and can build our system like the last one. It's all an example of how knowing why we do something as opposed to only knowing a particular step-by-step -step process lets us improvise when our situation departs from the textbooks. Ever had to improvise a rescue? If you feel like sharing, tell us about it in the comments. Thanks for watching this video. Please like, subscribe, and share if you want to support us. For more information, you can go to our website at www.shortguysbetaworks.com. You can watch a related video on descending a taut rope, which is something you might have to do in a scenario like this without sufficient brake strand to reach the climber, or you can check out that series I mentioned on technical scrambling. We'll see you next week and keep on getting more out of that big outside.